So in other words, what I was saying is, you look better than I do. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I am Big Z from Side by Side Guys, and I'm joined by my co-host... Ian Blomgren with Full Throttle Battery. And it's a pretty exciting day, Ian. What's going on? Well, we got a new release to talk about. Kawasaki came to the table with a sport machine. Oh, man. No more mules and no more Terexes. Oh, not quite. Still a Terex, right? Still a uh, Terex. So they came out with the Kawasaki 2020 KRX 1000. Um, and if you were to look at the part number, it's the 1000 ALF. Uh, I believe that refers to the colorway, uh, their Kawasaki green colorway. So uh, kind of before we get into it, what was your expectation going into this? Speculation. Were they going to bring out a naturally aspirated machine? Were they going to bring out a uh, forced induction machine? Uh, a lot of the numbers that we're looking at going through the spec sheet, very consistent with what we've been hearing. Um, but it's good to finally get eyes on this thing and really kind of get an idea of what it's going to be all about. Yeah, I think there was kind of uh, two camps of expectations. There were the guys that were uh, diehard Cowie fans, and they were looking for you know true, tested, reliable, right. never going to have to worry about it type thing. And if you follow uh, the forums online, diehard Cowie fan is going nuts right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the other camp was the guys that are racers or, or want to be racers, right? And they, they want a, the high horsepower. They want something new and different and right. bigger and better, uh, bolder, innovative. And going through the specs on this machine, it looks like it's going to basically check all the boxes. Very, very versatile machine for multiple platform type applications, so... All right, so if we just want to do a quick rundown, um, they they launched the Cowie at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific, October 7th today. And uh, so what we're looking at is a four-stroke parallel twin dual overcam, uh, liquid-cooled 999cc Cowie motor out of one of their motorcycles, I believe, or the same platform anyways. Um, and then uh, we're taking a look at... Uh, we got some numbers on bore and stroke and torque uh, compression, which most people don't even know what their <laughs> their stroke and their compression are on their machines. Right. Fox 2.5s, double wish phone, very consistent with what we've been seeing from the competitors out there. Yeah, those 2.5 podiums are pretty standard on uh, most modern sport yeah. machines. 31-inch tires. And it looks like Maxxis is kind of doing away with those car with those uh, those Bighorn tires and focusing on those carnivores. They seem to be a pretty popular tire. Yeah, it seems to be that way for sure. Um, I know a number of guys that have them and they swear by them and they they've gone through two or three sets and it's because they're mean on them. It's not because they're a bad tire. Right. So uh, we're looking at those 31 inch carnivores. They're 10 inch wide on 15 inch beadlocks, which are standard. So beadlock standard is something different from most of the rest of the industry except for maybe some of the rock crawling additions right uh which i like to see i mean that's that's a great first attempt at a um good launch wheel uh and it looks like it's a eight ply tire as well so that's that's nice yeah, it looks like kind of a wheelbase like happy medium between an rzr and like a x3 i want to say the x3 is what is that 104 versus like 98 and just barely below 99 on the cowie Right. Well, and we'll get into all the comparison numbers. Uh, yeah. We got a nice little write up on that. Uh, but for uh, as far as your dimensions on the machine, you're looking at for the two seater model, which they've not released or announced any four seaters yet. Uh, we're looking at a length of 130 inches uh, or 68 inches wide and 75 inches tall, which is uh, pretty respectable numbers compared to some of the industry. Um, the 75 inch height, though, concerns me a little bit. It's pretty tall. Um, taller than I would have expected from them. Yeah. Um, and if we look at the, uh, it's got a nice big cargo bed at 14 by 33, uh, by nine inches tall and the curb weight. Now the curb weight threw us off a little bit. Yeah. You know, comparing it to some of the other high performance machines, I think, you know, it's coming in just under 1900 pounds, give or take. So when you put a full tank of fuel in there and a guy our size, you're probably gonna be tipping the scales at about 21, 2200, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, and that, that has a lot of implications on sure. suspension, on handling, on speed, takeoff, um, and all those numbers. So we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, and then we're taking a look at some of that suspension. So uh, front wheel travel is 18.6 inches with a rear of 21.1 inches. That's pretty park for the course when you're considering Fox 2.5s right. um, on a modern sport platform. 
Um, front suspension, uh, double wishbone, A arms, like most everybody, um, outside of maybe some of the trail machines that don't do that. Um, and then we're looking at the rear suspension of a standard trailing arm, but with a three link uh, radius rod setup. So we're we're seeing the standard two link in the back, and then an additional third link right in front of the caliber, um, right behind the trailing arm to provide extra stability on that. Extra stability, extra toughness when you slam into uh, tree stumps, stuff like that, like we all do. <laughs> shared, shared shock load for sure. Rocks. <laughs> and especially on that front side, right? That front side is the first to take the torque right. one way or the other. Um, the, the, the Fox 2.5 podiums with 24 clickable adjustment, that's um, something I know I personally have missed going from a XP Turbo down to an XP 1000 and losing the Fox shocks, right? They have that 24 clicks of adjustment. Um, whereas with Walker Evans shocks that I had on my 1000, uh, I think it only had like 16 or 18 clicks, something like that. But when you're, when you're trying to find that sweet spot, it makes a world of difference. And that 24 is nice to see for sure. Um, are you surprised that they didn't go with any of the modern, um, electronically controlled shock adjustments like the recently announced live valves and the Kings and all that stuff? Uh, not shocked. I mean, in the initial offering probably want to keep costs down a little bit. Maybe they bring out a later model somewhere down the road, but, uh, in reality, you know, with the exception of the four seater Talon, Polaris is the only one doing that live valve type stuff right now. I think it's just going to be a little slower process for everybody else to jump into the mix of that, but Right. And development of this machine started way before right. that was launched. So we right. wouldn't expect to see it unless they were, um, you know, working behind the scenes to optimize for that machine. So, um, you know, cabin comforts uh, doesn't have much to speak about. There's not like anything special like a Polaris Ride Command or um, the Yamaha navigation system or anything like that. It's pretty sparse. But, you know, sparse doesn't mean bad, right? Right, right. And uh, the seats look fairly fairly tall in the shoulder width, so they, they don't like taper down too fast, and you'll have good support on, on both your shoulders. Um, it'd be interesting to see how um, uh, some harnesses would look on those seats. You know, if you're not upgrading the seats right away, they look like they would help support that strap over your shoulder instead of letting it slide down that little bit, which can cause some irritation. Right. Being a bigger guy, ergos are going to be crucial, but there really wasn't anything that we were looking at in the interior of the car that threw off any alarms or anything. It looks like it's probably going to be a very, very comfortable rig for, for everybody out there. Seat adjustment. Uh, there's a few pictures I saw on Facebook as well, where the seat adjustment looks like uh, it's going to be suited for people five, four to six, four. So yeah, that, that driver's seat looked like it came pretty yeah. far forward. Yeah. Um, now I didn't see anywhere saying or mentioning the passenger side adjustment. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't any adjustment on right. that. Um, many of the manufacturers are starting to go towards single seat, you know, adjustability. So um, one thing that you'll notice the first thing when you sit down to, to turn the unit on and, and get going is that there's a high, low, neutral and reverse. There's no park. And uh, they've included a parking brake, which I don't think I've seen any side by side sport side by side. YXZ a, has one. Does the YXZ have yeah. one? Um, that has that outside of what you just said. Yeah. So, um, it's interesting. It looks very much automotive, like the implementation of it looks very kind of, um, you know, beginner car parking brake position <laughs> implementation. Um, but you know what I would have killed for that parking brake on a number of Hills that I was stuck on a number of times. Yeah. It's real handy on the YXZ. No question about it. Especially when you're getting it start. Um, I don't know how people like to start uphill on a YXZ. A lot of times what I would do is I'd lock the parking brake in, get the, get the motor going to where that clutch starts to engage and then drop it and take off. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's what a lot of climbers would do. Right. Um, and there's a lot of times where you're doing rescue missions where, um, you know, if you're on a steep incline and you're, you're parking and turning off the machine to go take care of winching or anything like that, uh, you'll find that getting that machine out of gear or out of park, I should say, and into gear is very difficult sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And you find yourself doing the, the fake boat motion, trying to get the thing moving to get out of gear. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to see that. Yeah. Not to get too fickle about this, but the lines of it. I, I, I really like it. I think it's a very clean looking, sharp car, no question about it. And that's kind of the general consensus that I'm reading online as well as everybody's pretty pleased with how it looks. So I would say that, uh, from the most, most of the conversation I've heard around Kawasaki is that, uh, the guys really don't want anything fancy and crazy. A little bit of modernization is fine, but what they really want is simple, clean, 
straightforward, slightly aggressive, uh, and then leave the rest up to them. Right, right. So in the first show, we discussed evolutions versus revolutions. Do you see a revolution here? I definitely see a re- evolution of the Terex platform. Right. Right. So uh, Terex has been kind of their go-to side-by-side for anyone that wants to have any kind of adventure. And I think this is just the next evolution of that platform and you'll probably end up seeing more development in the uh, krx platform versus the standard terex platform you'll probably see that reduced down to only a couple models right i agree uh just those couple models that'll fit the price point between the mule and the krx right um up front for the driver you got an instrument cluster it looks like it's a um a positive LCD crystal to where you're adding uh, digits to the screen. It looks very clear and concise. Um, I don't know if I would need the gear selection that big in my instrument cluster, taking up a third of the screen, but uh, the miles per hour, all that looks like it's great information to have. Um, you have your 4x4 indicator. You have your em- engine temp. Uh, your battery voltage is on screen. That's nice uh, if you're a guy that's running a lot of stuff. Uh, but other than that, there's nothing out of the world, out of this world to make that any different than anyone else. Um, standard CVT, um, uh, that was kind of expected, right? I, I wouldn't expect, uh, someone like Kawasaki to come out with some fancy paddle shifting car, uh, out the gate anyways. Uh, passenger, um, I kind of jumped off course there, but passenger has a standard T handle support. Um, the doors are front hinged. So that's cool. Yeah, I like the doors, actually. I was, you know, in terms of a factory OE machine, I've always been very partial to the YXZ doors. I've always been very partial to the Wildcat 2X doors. This looks like it's going to touch that. uh, It's going to be kind of in that same vein. And uh, just to clarify as well, I'm looking at a picture right now. We do have adjustability in the passenger seat, according to this picture I'm looking at right here. So. Um, it'd be interesting to see if they went with a standard metal on metal slider or if they went with a roller like the count, right. the Honda and the XP pro, uh, have done and made a much better user experience there because there's nothing worse than getting out on the trail. And then you're trying to adjust because you switch drivers or, you know, whatever, and you can't move it cause it's m- crusted over in mud or, you know, sand got in there and locked it up. Um, and then, uh, speaking back to those doors, uh, fully enclosed on both sides, so you're not seeing the exposed frame that you've seen on multiple different uh, makes and models, uh, which makes which I I've come to actually find that it gives you more value feel in the machine. When you see the frame, you feel like you, they've skimped out somehow, and having that fully enclosed door is a is a nice touch. Um, I'm seeing some pocket inserts where you can easily add some speakers, like maybe they have some aftermarket speaker pods to go on those doors. Um, so that'd be interesting to see the, the full lineup of third party accessories that'll come out for those. Uh, I'm very curious about this lower retention system they've put into the door. It looks like it's a spot for either some sort of air bottle or fire extinguisher or something like that. Um, I would like to kind of hear their marketing. flask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd like to hear the story on the marketing side of what that's for. Um, yeah, forgive me, but uh, did you mention it as a CV temp jack, uh, CVT temp gauge as well? I can't remember. Is it a CVT or is it just a water temp? It says CVT temp down below the RPM. So, I mean, it very well could come factory with that. And so it looks. That would so, be very cool. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sure. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Under the drive selection. So, yeah. Um, that would be a unique angle. They having an actual sensor on board in the in the clutch cover. That's smart. Um, so to work our way out of the driver cabin, uh, we have. Let's just take a look at the front end, right? This this is the first thing people see when they see this machine and and what it looks like, what it represents. Um, I kind of feel like Polaris and Honda and Aterix kind of had a wild night and came out with this. Similar lines, no doubt about it. Uh, see it a lot in the grill for sure. Head- yeah, that, that front grill is the, I mean, the first thing people see besides the headlights is the grill because um, that's the defining facial feature. It's like the nose of the machine. And it has a very pro or a very XP 1000 XP turbo feel to it. Right. And I, I read something online that the inspiration for the front end of the car was off one of the old school uh, 700 quads. Um, and oh, I, yeah, yeah, I did see a picture yeah, of that. They, yeah, they put a side by side on. You can definitely see the inspiration there. They have similar. And it lines. wasn't a bad look either. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was a blatant copy of any of the other OE's machines out there. And it, you have to let air through. So you're going to sure. have sure. the same kind of mesh as everyone yeah. else. Yeah. Um, 
interesting hood scoop. I wonder if they're going to, you know, down the road, make a, a turbo model or something like that, that would utilize that extra air intake um, outside of just for styling. Uh, down below, you'll see uh, a nice spot for a bumper and a winch, and they've already announced that they have uh, partnered with Warren for their VRX right. uh, 4,500 pound winch. Right. Um, looks like there's a lot of room behind that fascia to me. Like if you look at the the um, the radiator and all that, it looks like there's plenty of room back there to work around. Looks like a plenty of room for everything. Uh, there's already some photos that are online from uh, HCR where there uh, it's got an aftermarket cage on it. It looks beyond clean, so it looks like it's a machine that can be customized fairly fairly simply. So, and I would expect that it's fairly easy to work on as well. They're they're no newcomer to for sure. You know the maintenance game, so and they know what people want to do as well. Exactly. Uh, headlights, they have the LED projector headlights. They have um, an LED brow like all the machines do nowadays. Um, and they got some interesting looking uh, daytime running lights along with that. Uh, outside of that, the the thing left to talk about is the fender well, the wheel well there. So uh, very high, you know, way out of the way. There's nothing obtrusive or going to rub when you upgrade your tires. That's for all the Texas uh, owners that are going to be putting big tractor tires, doing all that mud bogging on it probably. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's definitely, there for sure. there's definitely clearance, uh, ample clearance for anything you want to upgrade to, right? right? Um, the one thing I was thinking about was uh, because of the torque numbers that they've pushed with this machine, uh, I wonder if this would be good on tracks. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. You know, I going just having a once over on the machine. Obviously, without net got without getting into it, without running it, it's uh, we have ourselves another great option that the OEs brought to the market, and it's it's going to come down to in a lot of ways on how tough the car is. And I'm sure, given Kawasaki's history, we're not going to be disappointed. Yeah, and, and speaking of tough, I'm looking at these front A arms, right? And <clears throat> the the approach angle of the arm, like the upper A arm, for example, and it comes down below the ball joint yeah, and then I comes back up with a good, looks like a good solid inch of, of metal there. Yeah. Um, and so I would expect those A arms to be fairly tough and rugged. Um, they are high clearance from the factory, so that's nice. Um, <clears throat> front sway bar is included along with rear sway bar. Uh, and there's nothing really to speak of special as far as brakes and calipers. Uh, that's more of a wait and see how they handle type thing. Right. Um, the axles compared to the A-arms look a little thin. Um, I, I don't know if that's like a, like a, a mind trick or a visual trick, but that's definitely something to look... Uh, I don't know about replacing it right away, but I, I would see how they hold up. Yeah, I'm looking at a picture right now of the axle, and it's, I wouldn't say it was like alarming or anything, but uh, yeah, it, we got to get close, get a closer look at the machine for sure. So looking at the side of the machine, uh, like you said, clean lines. Um, you have a nice little dip at the front of the door to, uh, from a, according to their marketing guy, you have clearance to see see your front end. Um, not sure if you can, I mean, we'll have to have sit, sat in the machine to know, but, uh, from the angles of the actual renders of the, of the product, it looks like you'd have to kind of lean forward now to see the front of the tire, but, right. um, that's, that's what they said it's for. Um, if it was solid all the way across, if it was just straight, it would look a little awkward in my opinion. I do like the visual aspect of it. Um, high rear fender, uh, guards. I agree with that. It looks good. And you get to the rear wheel wells, great fenders. Great height clearance. Um, I think the days of a fully enclosed rear end are gone. I think everybody's kind of just adopted the fact that the engine bay is going to be exposed. The suspension is going to be exposed. Um, these things run so so hot and powerful that I, I just don't foresee those days ever coming back. It's an advantage. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to see that there's no uh, direct airflow um venting uh for the rear end so like if you look at uh the new pro xp or the maverick uh x3s uh they all have these cutouts in the body panels to allow airflow to kind of suck back in behind the rear firewall and that helps it evacuate the hot air and i'm not seeing anything like that on here so it could just be the engine doesn't need it and maybe visually they just felt it was more important not to have those Right. Well, now that the machine's out, so, you know, some of the, some of the hearsay that I heard about the machine, um, uh, apparently they took the, took it out to Johnson Valley, put about a thousand miles on it somewhere in that neck of the woods. And, uh, after 
beating the tar out of it. They tore everything down and it showed little to no wear. So that kind of speaks to uh, what we were talking about, about toughness and stuff. And in, in terms of uh, when I'm thinking in my mind, time frame, if they were out at Johnson Valley over the last three to four months, somewhere in there doing some testing on this machine, it's probably ridiculously, t- uh, ridiculously hot out there. Yeah. So the, that could kind of uh, be a testament to the, the heat exposure that you're talking about. So, yeah, for sure. And, and I would expect to see these guys taking these things all year long through all the different conditions. And if you look at their media video, they show it in all the, all the different riding conditions, desert, rock, uh, forest trail, mm-hmm. all that. So I'm sure they put plenty of testing in on it. Right. Um, as far as getting to the engine compartment, nothing looks out of the normal. It's a fairly standard approach. You put your V twin in the back, you throw your CVT clutch transmission onto it. Um, there's nothing that really stands out as different. The muffler setup is, I guess, different, uh, being an inline muffler, um, along the side of the body of the motor versus being rear mounted. Um, and the large can style muffler, it's more of the, um, dirt bike pipe approach. Right. right. Um, so that's interesting. I, um, would like to hear it up front, but from what I've heard on the audio of their launch event, it sounds much much like a motorcycle as well. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how that comes out uh, audibly on the trail. Uh, The cage comes back down to the rear of the bed. Uh, C-pillar approach, just like most brands are doing. Um, The cage for for the unit comes back where the normal muffler can would be, but there's room behind there for upgrades. So I know that they have uh, some upgrades for that area of the body, but I don't know what they are. their media kit has a lot of missing images and yeah. lack of detail in that department. But uh, the back looks good to me. It looks kind of boring in my opinion, but it doesn't have to be exciting. It's the rear end, right? Right. And the guy behind you, you don't want to give him anything to look at beside your dust. So Yeah, and kind of going through the specs too, one thing I'm not noticing here, unless I am blind, I'm not noticing what, uh, what it's putting out from a stator standpoint. See anything on that regard? I did not. As a battery guy, obviously, that's one of the things you look at. And that's one thing that I've kind of noticed about the new uh, RZR Pro is it uh, at 12 volts, roughly putting about 75 amps, which conventional cars put out about 50. So 75 is kind of a game changer, you know, for yeah. guys that are putting big audio, big lights and stuff on. It'd be interesting to see what this one is, but I don't see any, I don't see any detail about it yet. Yeah, the... It's interesting when you mentioned that last episode, I was looking at, you know, what cars are putting out and it seems to be in that 60, 65 stated range. And then they're actually putting out less than that. Right. Um, And uh, it'd be interesting to see, you know, what they're doing. I would expect it probably the same as what their 1000 bikes put out, you know, in that 50 to 60 range. Um, Yeah. So outside of that, there's really not a whole lot to speak of on the machine as far as uh, visually. Uh, the last things I would probably mention are that it comes with a, a full skid plate um, from the factory, which is nice. Uh, the Pro and the Trail Edition rides are the only ones I can think of that actually do that besides uh, any other sport machine. Um, one thing that I did, uh, I got a l- to listen a little bit of the press or of the dealer meeting announcement uh, before the live streams cut off. One thing that um, they did mention, and I was thinking about this the other day with some of the cars I was looking at, they put a stainless, sl- let me say that again, a stainless steel sleeve over the threads of um, the shock tower, so or the shock itself. So where you would do your um, crossover adjustment, um, they put steel sleeves over those threading to protect it from wearing down over time of that movement, uh, which I thought was an interesting uh, attention to detail because uh, a lot of times these guys get these turbos, they go ride them all summer and then they go to a do it adjustment over the winter to kind of fine tune it and they're like realizing they can't spin the thing because it's stuck. Right. Um, so that was interesting. Um, we have they've stated a dual rate spring setup. Um, I'm interested to know if it's truly a dual rate spring or if it's just the standard tender spring with sta- with main spring. Um, you know, that's the first thing a lot of shock guys or uh, desert guys do is they replace the springing uh, on their shock towers. And so I would I would like to know if those are true dual rate springs, because that would be the thing that a lot of guys would just say up front, like, well, mine's got dual rates. Yours has a baby, baby tender. Um, 90 degree approach. The wheels are on all four corners of the car. So 
if you're trying to climb over anything or approach something, you're going to hit wheel first, not, you know, your plastics. So that's nice. Um, we talked a little bit about the doors, uh, having full doors again, I think should just be standard these days. I don't, I don't see why anyone's putting half doors on it anymore. I agree. Probably to keep the cab cool, but maybe not. Right. So. And I'm, and I'm wondering, I mean, it's got a fairly large radiator in the front of this thing. I'm not sure how hot it's going to get, but I would assume that with some models now including air dams in the front and like the Pro XP having a solid plastic front firewall instead of all open um, on the top, I would expect that they're probably not too hot and not having a lot of high end horsepower out of this machine. Um, I wouldn't expect to see a lot of heat build up on the front end. Yeah. Horsepower wise, I haven't seen anything official from Calia, but uh, on the forums they are saying 113. The, the only thing we have on the web page is a uh, 76.7 foot pounds of torque at 7,000 RPM. That's really the only thing they released, but I assume, you know, I yeah. hate to say that the internet is right, but they might be right in this instance. Yeah. And I, I did ask a uh, dealer that was at the show um, publishing videos to, you know, what the horsepower numbers were because they weren't stating it on the stage and they weren't stating it on the site and it's not in the press kit and it's not anywhere. But uh, he confirmed that it's 112 uh, as far as the information he was given. So uh, we're looking at 112. And when you said uh, 76 foot pound of torque at 7,000, um, you know, that's the mid to higher upper range of For the sure. RPM level, right? So uh, I'd be interested to see what that torque is down lower than that, where you're doing approaches or you're pulling right. off a rock or, or whatever. Um, and so not them, not putting out the horsepower numbers is an interesting story, simply from the fact that, um, they're not concerned with competing with the turbo cars, nor should they be in my, in my opinion, you know, I mean, I think this, this car is made to compete with the XP 1000, the YXC, the, uh, the two X, um, can am had a naturally aspirated. I think it's gone away now. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's, it's kind of right in there in line with, uh, the other OEMs, you know, what I think the Honda, the Honda is about, was it one fifteen or somewhere in that ballpark, if I remember correctly. So, I mean, this thing's pretty comparable to the other machines that are available right now. Yeah, so I did a little look up right before the show just to kind of get some numbers written down. Um, and we we take a look. Well, let's first talk about price. Mm -hmm. So they came in at 2500 That seems a little higher than I was expecting. I was expecting them to come in at eighteen nine or nineteen nine, um, especially when their Terexes are, you know, five grand less than that. Right, right. Um, and, their Tegra, and just to speak to that, their Terexes are not bad machines. They're actually very good competent machines most people that own terex is kind of adopt to the principle that during nuclear war cockroaches and terexes will survive very <laughs> exactly. very tough vehicles uh yeah so they're known for the robustness and they're known to right. be able to go wherever you want to go uh with consideration for your clearance but um I was a little surprised that they didn't come under 20. I thought that would be a big selling point for them. It kind of makes me wonder if it's the same thing that with the YXE. You know, the YXE in most of the situations is listed about that 20,000 mark. We could go to a dealer right now and probably get it for about 16.5, 17.5, somewhere in that ballpark. So there's there's map pricing, there's MSRP, but then there's what you can actually pick it up from the dealer at. Right. And, and the OEM approach to a lot of this is different depending on which vendor you're going with where, you know, you can go to a Razor dealer. And that razor is going to be sold for what the sticker says, right? Minus maybe some upgrades for free or whatever. Uh, you can go to an X3 dealer, get that X3 for roughly that same sticker price that you were quoted. So you'll go to a lot of these moto dealers and they'll, they'll have it marked up just a little bit. So that, to allow the dealer to work with the customer and, and work in the deal of getting the machine out the door, help compensate a little bit for tax, help get some, you know, maybe some accessories put on or things like that. Um, but I think it's an, an interesting approach that the dealers that just make the units are, are pricing their stuff hard on their map. And then the guys that are doing other, other territories like moto and, um, quads, things like that, they allow a little bit more flexibility on that pricing, which is interesting to me. Yeah. So if we look at what, um, what we're competing against, right? So I took some notes on, on the different brands. And so looking at... I mean, the biggest market out there is the Polaris people, right? The Razors. So if we take a look at the Razors, Kawasaki came in at 2,500. Uh, a Pro XP, which is not naturally aspirated, right? Yeah, a little it, bit apples and oranges. It's a little bit different, but it's only 2,500 bucks more. 
Right. Which, if you're spending twenty grand, twenty five hundred more is more than palatable, in my opinion. Um, and then, and then you have uh, the XP one thousand, which is eighteen six hundred. Uh, so you you pay less for the XP one thousand. Um, curb weight, you're looking at 1896 on that KRX and you're looking at 1448 on that 1000 razor. Um, that's a 450 pound difference. That's two, huge. That's a huge amount of weight. Yeah. Uh, that's two people worth. Right. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, when we're talking about horsepower and how that's Im- impacted by weight, uh, you know, that's going to directly impact your user experience potentially yeah it all, it's all going to come down to how the machine's geared for sure but uh yeah i i think that uh I th- it's going to be interesting to see what this thing machine does over the next say 18 months or something from a price standpoint because that is a massive difference in uh price weight yeah power exactly. weight right up front that's just ball. two big whammies it, right it's big and so if you continue that that exploration on the on the xp1000 uh we're talking about a width of eight of uh, 60 eight inches on the KRX and you're looking at 64 on that XP 1000. So the 64 inch platform has consistently gotten kind of two attacks on it. It's gotten either it's too wide or it's too narrow. Like the 72 inch guys are always like, I can't believe you drive that thing. Whereas, you know, the 50 50 inch inch guys guys. are, you can't go anywhere. You can't follow me. Right. And uh, so it's interesting to see their entry platform come out at 68 inches and not be able to go on what I would assume would be their primary market's uh, writing um, capabilities and be 18 inches over the standard trail limitations that you would find day to day. So that, it, I have this kind of gray area in my mind of who their target market is. Like it, I, I think it's the sports guy because those guys, the, the Kawasaki motorbike guys are always going fast, going hard, winning races but they're not going to be seeing the horsepower here to go that fast. Right. right. And then you have the guys that are the loyalists, the guys that want the rugged ability, uh, reliability and things like that. And they're mostly in the mountains and half their trails are cut off from them because it's 68 inches wide. Right. So I'm, I'm wondering if there was a lot of compromise back and forth of, you know, where do we get the most accepted acceptance out of this platform for each market? And then kind of cobble together all those specs. Right. Yeah. We're completely speculating as to what this thing is capable of, but I don't think anybody in the industry or anybody in the market for a machine is going to be surprised if this thing is a absolute tank. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, and I don't mean that in weight. I mean that in brute toughness. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, from the frame uh, detail that I saw and f- like from the, the front A arms and the re- trailing arm and all that stuff, it, it all looks very well built and very thick. Um, it doesn't, nothing looks cheaply made. Uh, it looks fairly stout. So, um, and then we talk about wheelbase. So, if we look at an XP1000, we're at 90 inches, but on this guy, it's 98.8, 99 inches long. Right. Uh, that's a fairly significant wheelbase. Kawasaki had, what, five, six years to develop a machine and understand what it is that the end user wants, understand what it is that uh, some of the weak points and maybe some of the other machines. So to come to the table with a machine that is anything less than bomb proof, (laughs) I think at this point is going to be a mistake. And this thing does look to be very, very stout. Yeah. And when we're, and we're talking about wheelbase, that has a lot of things that it affects. Right. Right. It's not just um, getting over stuff or not getting over stuff, depending on if you're a short wheelbase guy. Uh, but you're also talking about how it absorbs whoops, how you're handling around corners. Um, all those things are impacted by wheelbase. And the only thing near that kind of wheelbase, uh, we're talking about the pro XP at 96 inches. We're talking the X3 turbo, um, at 102 inches. And we're talking about the wildcat at 95 inches. Everything else is in that, uh, high eighties to low nineties. Right. Um, and that wheelbase I found coming from a four-seater platform in my last three machines and driving a number of two-seater machines, um, that wheelbase has a lot of advantages to it. It improves, uh, improves ride quality. For sure. Yeah. And every time I bring a two-seater guy into my machines that were four-seaters, they were always, oh, this is a school bus, ha, ha, ha. And then we go through the whoops, we go through you know the sand dips and stuff like that, and they're just like, wow, that, <laughs> that handled a lot better than my two-seater. I've gone through uh, Idaho Mountains in my YXE, going through some of the tightest stuff known to man, uh, escorting a four-seater around and getting out in front of that four-seater going, uh, the obstacle I just went through, they have no prayer getting through. 
Right. Next and that would know. be the biggest thing is yeah. if, if you have a long wheelbase, obstacle and turn radius are your enemies. Right. And then the next thing, you know, they're right on my heels. So they got through it, obviously. So <laughs> <laughs> where there's a will, there's a way. There's, there's absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and let's talk a little bit about clearance, right? We're talking about 14.4 inches of clearance uh, on those 31 inch carnivore tires. Um, so with arch day arms, high clearance rear trailing, um, that third link on the radius rods is up and out of the way. Uh, unlike the Honda where it's kind of dips down below and then goes up from there towards the front of the cab. Um, all of its high clearance, there was nothing underneath that looked obstructing or, or catching. Uh, but 14 and a, uh, roughly 14 and a quarter uh, inches. And then we look at the competition on that, right? Everybody is at 14 or higher, unless you're talking about maybe a Talon X, which is at 12.7. The new RR X3 is roughly at about 16. So, yeah, I'd say that the, uh, the new machine's right in the ballpark where it needs to be. And one thing I, I kind of took away from that, uh, from the from the pictures of people at the dealer event looking at the machine is that it, it seemed bigger than it I would have thought it been. So I don't know if it's just the high plastics or if it's the extended wheel wells or whatever, but um, it feels like a very large capable machine. It doesn't come across. To, um, if you walk up on a YXE on a lot, you almost feel like it's a go kart just in your first impression approach to it. Cause it, the front end slopes all the way to the ground the rear end's wide open and and not thick at all. And then you sit inside of it, you're like, okay, yeah, there's plenty of room in this thing. It's fairly good sized, right? Or if you go look at a, a Razor, that boxy uh, feel of it is pretty substantial on the lot. You walk up to it, you're like, this is a big car. I can do anything in this car. Um, look at, a, at a, an XX and you kind of feel like, wow, this is a big boat. It's very long and flat, wide. Should be pretty stable in almost everything I do with it. Um, but this thing, it, it kind of gave me the impression of, um, a very good presence. It had a very good stance. It had a very good approach angle on no matter how you looked at it. Um, and the roll cage doesn't look silly. It looks stout, looks solid. The front end looks what you would expect it to look like. You're not walking up and seeing something weird or different than everybody else. You're kind of walking up to it and going, yeah, that's what I would expect to see. Um, and I think that's a big selling point for something that's first gen, um, from a manufacturer that's never had something in that specific market. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the, the horsepower being at 112. Uh, I just wanted to do a quick comparison to some of the competition. Uh, if we look at the Honda, you're looking at 104. Um, if you're looking at the XP 1000, you're looking at 110. Um, the XP, uh, I'm sorry, the X3 Turbo, you're looking at 120 for the base model. Uh, the XX, you're looking at 130. So 112 is kind of right where you would expect it to be, maybe a little lower than I would have wanted it to start at. I would have maybe wanted to see like 120 or something like that. Yeah, the uh, um, the 2X for naturally aspirated is kind of on the high side where it's at 130. And if I, if I remember correctly, as far as the naturally aspirated cars, that's the top, is that uh, that 130. Right. And and so my my thought pattern goes as a as a purchaser of a machine. And if I'm doing, if I'm not a Kawasaki loyalist and I'm not, um, coming from a Terex or something like that, you know, I'm going to be exploring all my options. Right. And when you look at the competition, you see the Honda, which is kind of in that same camp of rugged reliability that can always depend on that motor. I can always depend on that transmission. Um, I'm never going to have a problem at the dealer cause I love the dealer there. That's the kind of feeling you would have with a Cowie or a Honda. And, uh, to have 104 on a Honda, you'd be like, oh, instantly sold. It's one more than the other guy that you see on the track every day. Yeah, that's uh, it's definitely a topic online right now is the horsepower numbers. And, you know, most buyers, some buyers are horsepower driven. Most buyers are probably not. You know, right. I, I don't think it's going to be a big deciding factor, especially considering that uh, it, it's all going to come down to what it puts down to the ground, how it's geared, you know. Yep. And then if you are a buyer that's just wanting the biggest, baddest, whatever, you're probably not in this price range market. You're probably another eight grand or more above that. Right. Uh, but what I find interesting is that the XP Pro came out at twenty two nine ninety nine, and that's only two hundred fifty bucks more for one hundred eighty one horsepower, for fourteen and a half, same amount of clearance, basically, almost the same wheelbase, a little bit narrower. But if you've watched any of the reviews of the machine and they, everyone says that performs like a 72, right? Um, so you're a little bit more capable on the trails, getting through certain areas and fitting on certain trails. Um, 
I find that you also have that 450 pound weight difference. Right. So, so to, for you, would you, if you were to buy one machine for the next five years, right. And you were presented with those numbers. I mean, would you, would you rather go towards reliability or would you go towards, you know, hot, newest, highest tech platform? Cause I mean, we're also talking about that pro XP coming at that number with Walker Evans shocks. They're not the Fox shocks, right? So you're gonna have better shocks on the KRX. Uh, you're probably going to have better low end torque numbers, uh, for crawling around and low. Uh, but on the high end, you're going to be probably a little bit better off with the, the pro performance per dollar. If, uh, if you go roughly, I drive on a, on a side by side, I drive somewhere in the ballpark of about 1500, plus miles per year. And I would say somewhere between a third of that to a half of that is on sand. I'm going with the turbo. So right. for at that price point. So yeah, I think if you're gonna be a sand guy, if you've got your Kawasaki, you know, bike set up with paddle tires and you're going out for the weekend and you want to take your side by side with you, uh it's probably not going to be the machine to get all the way up that sand hill. Um I don't I don't foresee guys carving huge bowls of these things, uh maybe doing the camp to camp thing or the camp to ocean or something like that. But I don't I don't see them competing on the on the big whoops and the big big, big All sandals. comes down to fortitude. you'd be you'd be surprised where I can put my Y X E out on the Oregon <laughs> coast. So <laughs> Yep, yep, for sure. Yeah. Um Yeah, so as far as the competition goes, you know, everybody is in either that like nineteen thousand dollar range or they're in that like twenty five hundred dollar range range and this comes right in the middle of that so i foresee that being an easy excuse for a, for a loyalist or for anyone that's in that honda kawasaki um camp right even the yamaha camp i guess would would apply to that as well um seeing that number and being like well we can work with our dealer i know my dealer i talk to him you know once a month or whatever uh and, and get that number down just a little bit um but yeah, I, I don't think it's a bad offering. I think it's a great option for the Kawasaki guys. Yeah, we'll have to revisit this in the spring, you know, see what the dealers are unloading these things for, kind of see what the initial success has been. I mean, I, I think we keep talking about loyalists. Mm-hmm. There's the Yamaha loyalists. There's uh, Honda loyalists. There's Kawasaki loyalists. So I think initially you're going to see people jump into that platform because they have a trust basis with that brand. And uh, I think probably about springtime, maybe, maybe towards uh, summer, we're going to be into a situation where if there's any differences like that, we'll, we'll start to, it'll start to rear its head. Right. And we'll, we'll see these, these units start to get delivered probably in the next month. Right. And so, right. Um, yeah, I was actually told by a dealer that as soon as the release was done, they could put orders in. Right. (laughs) Yeah. They were pretty tight lipped on this. They were. I mean, we saw patent releases early on. We have a write up on that on our website, but it, Every other manufacturer's had severe leaks related to platform launches, and Kawasaki was pretty darn tight. Yeah, the Pro had a leak eight months to 14 months before it almost, was released. Almost two years was ahead of time. Almost two years, yeah. Is and when everybody we first was, swore to God, that was the RS1, and they oh, couldn't yeah, have been yeah. more wrong. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, so, it looked a lot like it, right? Yeah, and the RS1, bit, yeah. the RS1 yeah. did play into that body styling a lot. Right. And uh, the RS1 at that point was probably almost done. Yeah, I didn't think it was an RS1 just because the cage was different. Yeah, so. it was definitely wider than it would have been, right? For sure. So, um, but... Uh, yeah, props to Kawasaki for keeping the lid tight on this. Uh, I it, did hear a rumor that uh, when they brought in some of the aftermarket support companies to take a look at this thing, that at that time they were one of six to seven people not affiliated with Kawasaki that had laid eyes on the car. So, yeah, yeah they did a very good job of keeping it hush-hush. I'm really interested because the leaked photos were on trucks. They were in the back of uh, 4853 footers. and Probably getting delivered to that launch event. <laughs> probably probably some uh, probably Some, some unemployed truck, truck driver truck right now. driver that, uh, yeah, Polaris fan or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, I think that speaks maybe to the size of Kawasaki as well. Like they're fairly large in the moto scene, but in their side by side department, it's almost like that baby brother department of the company for sure. And uh, when it's that small, you can keep it pretty tight. So, anyways, props to them for keeping that hush hush. Um, though I will admit that their patent guy probably can do a little bit more vague drawings next time. It was pretty close to the drawings. It's pretty spot on. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree with that for sure. Those blueprints, uh, it looks. It's the same machine. So. Uh, I just noticed that one thing I didn't mention 
is the better the machine has the capability of pulling a uh, a full size tire in the back as well. So mm-hmm. it, uh, taking a cue from the Wildcat and the Pro and all that stuff, that you, you can take your spare and lay it flat in the bed, um, and that's a big advantage from a, coming from a a, a razor where the the spare tire carrier blocked your entire rear view. Um, you know that was a great option to see them implement. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to say on this? Overall, I'm I'm very pleased. I can't wait to get behind the wheel of it. Hopefully, you know, we'll see. Um, I would love to see Kawasaki showing up at some of the events coming up in 2020 and give everybody an opportunity to get behind the wheel of these things and check them out. You know, when you go to the UTV takeovers and uh, especially in Coos Bay, the majority of the OEs are out there. You can get into a Can-Am, you can get into a Polaris and you can get into a Yamaha. And I would love to see this follow suit because obviously when you first take a look at it, first thing you want to do is drive it. And, yep. you know, I think it'd be a great opportunity. Yeah, for sure. It looks like a great machine. Um, you know, no one's going to be wowed by it, but at the same time, everyone's going to love it. So it checks all the marks for sure. I mean, for the sure. racing community will see what they wind up developing and doing with that car. But uh, in turn, if I'm going to go into the mountains up here in Idaho, that's that's going to be a great machine. No question about it. I have, I have no doubt in my mind. Yep. Great machine. Excited for the launch. Can't wait to see it. And uh, great episode. Yeah. Thanks for coming by. Absolutely. All right. See you guys next time. Peace.